in this analogy, the orange juice refers to biblically correct statements, and arsenic refers to pagan practices and carnal teachings. The carnal mind is blinded by the supposed value of the orange juice, and since the carnal mind already you know, starts with a high tolerance for arsenic. Therefore, the presence of some additional arsenic, aka pagan customs, traditions, beliefs, and practices, isn't really a major problem for the carnal mind. Imagine you have a glass of pure orange juice. Then you add a highly concentrated arsenic poisoning. The content is steered well to achieve a uniform mixing. This glass now becomes highly toxic and poisonous. Will you drink from this cup? This is what the Bible is like. I call it the Bible glass. Biblical scholars and Christian apologetics only see the orange juice and they rave about the nutritional benefits of it. When the presence of arsenic toxicity and poisoning is pointed out to them, they say that's not a problem because we have ways to filter out all the toxic poisonous arsenic. Then we can still get the benefits of that orange juice. Their desire for the orange juice blinds them to the fatal effects of arsenic. They believe that the value of the orange juice should not be diminished simply because there is also some arsenic present. They will seek to retrieve from this poisonous mixture as much of the original orange juice as they, can, they, they possibly can, except that this orange juice does not exist anymore. Let me give you another analogy. There have always been people since the Old Testament times who have tried to produce forgeries or of instructions from God. People have produced books pretending to be Isaiah, pretending to be Daniel, or some other servants of God. Such works are generally known as apocryphal books because they are identified as spurious. The same happened after the church was started in Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Numerous works started appearing in the names of some of the apostles or some other prominent men in the early New Testament church. This is the reason why I talk about these things, to show people that a lot of false teachings that exist today existed back then and the Bible believers have been contending with this stuff ever since the church age started. Now, there is always one thing that such works do. They invariably claim to present information or instructions either from God directly or from one of God's recognized servants. But that presents such forgeries with an insurmountable problem. Do you know what that insurmountable problem is? The forgeries are all carnal, unrepentant people, servants of Satan, since Satan is the obvious real author of fake religious teachings and instructions. Satan is the father of all lies. Isn't that what John says in chapter 8 verse 44? Now, in order to attempt to deceive people into believing that what they are writing is a message of God's servants, they have to try to imitate how a converted mind, aka the mind of a servant of God, would think and reason, but that is impossible for them to do. The carnal mind is totally and absolutely incapable of mimicking the converted mind. The carnal mind cannot understand how the converted mind thinks and reason. The carnal and converted mind cannot see any difference between God's instructions and God's ways of doing things and its own interpretations of God's ways of doing things and its own interpretations of God's instructions and God's ways.
So the carnal mind actually thinks that it understands God's ways. The unconverted mind cannot see the difference between itself and a converted mind. And when the unconverted mind attempts to fabricate an instruction from God or from one of God's servants, even coding a biblical text, then it will always, and without exception, present such instructions from a carnal mind, an unconverted point of view. That's all the unconverted mind is capable of doing. Can you understand that God is never the author of carnally-minded instructions? I ask these questions because this is something the carnal mind itself cannot understand. That God will never give carnally-minded instructions. The carnal mind is hostile towards everything that represents God. And that hostility prevents the carnal mind from understanding how God thinks, and what God wants from us and expects from us and what actions are actually pleasing to God. The result is that the carnal mind wrongly assumes that certain actions will please God. Therefore, the carnal mind will devise such actions that it assumes will please God. The carnal mind will direct the focus towards do this and do that in its efforts to please God. You, a converted mind, should be able to learn to distinguish between carnally-minded instructions and instructions coming from a converted mind. You should be able to distinguish between a genuine instructions from a true servant of God, a.k.a. Jesus, peace be upon him, and a faked instructions from a false apostle, a.k.a. Paul. The converted and mind will simply never give certain instructions which same instructions the unconverted mind will view as noble and as pleasing to god there is a huge chasm between the converted mind and the unconverted mind yet the unconverted mind cannot even see that chasm as i have said before this is something that the unconverted mind is simply not capable of seeing or understanding. This point is illustrated by all the prophets and all the messengers that were sent by God the Almighty, including Jesus, peace be upon them all. Can you follow what I'm trying to explain? It is abundantly clear that the Bible is not even Christian in nature. It doesn't even at all reflect the teachings of Jesus. And it is consistently the expression of a total, total carnal mind. It has nothing whatsoever to do with any teaching that came from any of Jesus Christ's real apostles. The entire Bible is just so perversely carnal. Mind you not, many Christians have admitted to me that the Bible does not make no sense to them at all. The real author of the Bible is anonymous and unknown. It is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No one knows who they are. The Bible is attributed to these names, but doesn't change the fact that they are unknown. The carnal mind will say they are the apostles of Jesus. Yet in the Bible commentaries, these four people are unknown. The converted mind also looks and extensively tests this Bible glass. But the converted mind reaches a completely different conclusion. For the converted mind, the presence of the arsenic has totally and completely destroyed any value that might have been attached to the original pure uh, orange juice. The converted mind realizes that the mixture in its totality is highly toxic and that there is nothing good that can be salvaged from this mixture. The converted mind will attach zero value to the orange juice component of this mixture because the orange juice is severely tainted and degraded by the presence of the arsenic. In this context, the orange juice has no value at all for the converted mind. So the converted mind rejects the entire glass and wants nothing to do with it. In this analogy, the orange juice 
refers to biblically correct statements. And arsenic refers to pagan practices and carnal teachings. The carnal mind is blinded by the supposed value of the orange juice. And since the carnal mind already, you know, starts with a high tolerance for arsenic, therefore the presence of some additional arsenic, aka pagan customs, traditions, beliefs, and practices, isn't really a major problem for the carnal mind. So the converted mind, by contrast, is not really looking for statements it can agree with. The converted mind looks at the whole picture. And when the whole overall picture is toxic, then the converted mind recognizes that biblically correct statements in this context are of no more value. It is not that all the biblically more or less correct statements in the Bible are somehow not valid points. There are some valid points, but they have become meaningless and valueless in the context of the arsenic. And for that reason, the converted mind wants nothing to do with all the statements in the Bible. The converted mind knows that it cannot filter out the pure orange juice from the highly toxic arsenic environment. The whole glass has to be rejected. So as far as I'm concerned, there is no value whatsoever to any statements in the Bible. Whatever the good teachings and instructions the original gospel had, it is spoiled by the intervention of the carnal mind. I know that some of them are poor paraphrases of biblical statements, but the highly toxic context in which those statements appear has eliminated the value those statements might have had. Just like the presence of arsenic destroys the value of the orange juice. You must understand that the appearance of orange juice is supposed to blind you to the presence of the arsenic. Likewise, the presence of biblically correct statements presented indiscriminately is supposed to blind you to the heretical and the carnal statements liberally strewn all over the Bible. Scholars throughout history have examined the Bible. Most of them did not accept it as an authentic record of Christ's disciples. Any converted mind that reads the Bible from beginning to end will immediately recognize the Bible's connection with the false church. A converted mind will recognize that there is nothing in the Bible that correlates the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. The carnal mind simply cannot recognize carnal thinking and reasoning. And to conclude, the carnal mind is the mind that is dominated by selfishness. It's the mind that, that is self-willed, self-focused, and self-seeking. The carnal mind is devoid of the ability to surrender wholeheartedly to God. Don't be like the carnal mind that appeals more to selective obedience. Obey and submit to God the Almighty alone in total submission. The carnal mind tends to pick and choose which commandments to obey, to cut verses out of context, to justify behavior that is clearly condemned everywhere and to reason its way through direct statements in order to do its own thing. In many cases, the only commandments that are followed are the ones that yield immediate benefits, sound nice, and aren't too restrictive. This is called hostility and enmity against God because the carnal mind is enmity against God the Almighty. And no, I am not quoting from the Bible. This is in the Quran. The Quran is your greatest weapon in the war against the carnal mind. It is only through the Quran that you can overcome the influence of the carnal mind. I challenge you to read the Quran. If you don't have one, reach out to me. I'll make sure you get one. <laughs> Yeah, you know.
قال سبحانك ما يكون لي أن أقول ما ليس لي بحق إن كنت قلت فقد علمته تعلم ما في نفسي ولا 